Thanks, Jim, for the presentation, and thanks for the invitation. Um, my first slide, so beyond NIH-related funds, uh, these are my disclosures related to uh, corporations and industry. So also as a second uh, um, slide, so this is the type of work that I'm doing in the lab, so I'm interested in neurocognition and eating behavior and obesity. I'm especially, in, particularly interested in developing new methodologies to help us assess better all these mechanisms, and I'm very interested in innovation, and we are doing things like that, quantitative assessment of eating behavior and portable neuro neurotechnologies. But I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna be talking, uh, I'm not going to be talking about that or just a little bit of it. Uh, so the title of my talk is Beyond Food Reward, Broadening, broadening the Picture and Cognitive Influences. So the overview of my talk, I'm going to be talking, um, first I'm going to give you a summary of uh, I think what has been covered so far very well in this first part of the symposium, a uh, summary of key open issues in the food addiction model, then I'm going to uh, provide some sort of a broader in or zoom in out uh, to get a more uh, broader picture. And then I'm going to be talking about cognitive influences and cognitive control of food intake, links with overeating and obesity, and translational applications, and then end up with a conclusion. Um, so this is a summary of uh, some open issues that we have been talking about uh, uh, over the past uh, couple of hours. So according to the addiction, food addiction model, certain foods, especially sugar, can be addictive, or at least can be addictive in some individuals. And this at first, at least when we hear that, uh, we also need to acknowledge that, you know, some of those foods or those foods contain nutrients that are also needed for survival and we depend on. And uh, a sugar that is glucose is a key source of energy in the body and a primary source of energy in the brain. And uh, on, it, is, it is true that it must, it must be only a small number of individuals who try sugar who become addicted. addicted um, and so that raises... Uh, 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 basically the, the question whether uh, how much is the role of the potential um, addictive um, capacity or ability of certain foods versus individual vulnerability. So there are still key open questions around that. Uh, we have seen evidence from animal studies and the majority of the evidence, not all of it, but the majority comes from laboratory studies that have been done uh, and, 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 and looking at the impact of sugar specifically and uh, that is provided in intermittent cycles of access. And this is where, you know, the, the, the full spectrum or the most, um, uh, the manifestations are more in the full spectrum of related to addiction when, when sugar is delivered in intermittent cycles of access. But it is very hard to, uh, uh, it is very hard to, uh, to extend or, or to try to extrapolate how those findings can be uh, for the cases of humans because we are free individuals and we live in very, very complex food environments. Uh, it has been estimated that on a daily basis we make around 200 to 250 decisions related to food and we navigate uh, in supermarkets that carry uh, approximately 40,000 items uh, according to some statistics. So the, the complexity of human eating behavior and the way we make choices uh, it's really, really far complex than a, a restrictive cage. Uh, so also we have, we have seen uh, evidence coming from human uh, fMRI studies, and uh, uh, it is certainly true that palatable food activates reward regions in the brain, and we are learning a lot how those uh, responses change over time and how that relates to vulnerability of obesity. And um, we, we know that uh, these brain reward regions are also activated in fMRI studies in the field of uh, drug addiction. But it is true that also uh, the activation in these, these brain reward regions is also seen in other sources of uh, reward, such as money, sex, art, social cues. And it is true that fMRI, it, it is a great tool to study mechanisms, but um, it cannot be used to make a diagnosis of addiction because addiction is a subjective phenomenon that relies on the experience of the individual. So we should... Uh, also um, be aware of that. And there is also uh, upcoming evidence that it is true that there are overlaps in the brain regions that map to drug addiction and fo uh, food or obesity and eating disorders, but there is also evidence that some of this, uh, this overlap cannot, you know, it is not complete and there are specific uh, brain associations or, or association with brain regions that are more particular or specific for the case of eating disorders 
and uh, obesity that are not seen for the case of drugs. So here you can see the uh, brain areas that are associated uh, with drugs. This is a meta-analysis that was published this year. This is for the case of eating disorders and obesity, and this is uh, the areas that do not overlap, and they are more specific for the case of obesity and eating disorders. So there is evidence for overlap, but is, there is also evidence for some specificity of the brain link with uh, uh, eating disorders and obesity. Uh, also, to extrapolate findings from fMRI studies, we are limited because fMRI has, uh, well, uh, the ecological validity of what happens inside the scanner, which is a very noisy and restrictive experimental setting. Uh, it is unlikely to represent what we see in our daily lives, and this is a very nice study that proves that uh, if we do, if we put participants on a brain scanner and ask them to do uh, to perform a daily activity such as peeling an apple and we get the brain activation, and then compare that with the brain activation that the same participants do when they peel the apple, but uh, in a natural environment using a portable technology that is called FNIRS, that basically is something like a portable fMRI system, uh, something like that. So the activation is very different. So that's kind of a lesson that, you know, we need to also uh, be aware of the limitations in terms of ecological validity of what is being found with, with, being found with fMRI. And also, very importantly, uh, implications for treatment. So if certain foods are uh, addictive, so a, p a pillar of treatment will rely on abstinence. And you know, foods will be labeled or uh, tagged as bad and uh, bad or food, right? But we also have to be aware that, that some of this has been tried in the past, and we, have, we, we, we can learn or at least get some ideas or have an idea of, of what would happen if some such consequences would, would be tested. And we know from uh, the literature in obesity that low-carb diets are hard to sustain in the long run and may even affect mood. This is the results from randomized clinical trials. And uh, we also know from psychology that rigid, rigid versus flexible restriction, well, people who tend to be more rigid in their approach to food, they, they tend to be more associated with, um, uh, with weight gain and binge eating. So it is more favor a flexible restriction in, in, in the treatment of, of obesity. And, um, and also treatment of eating disorders, for instance, the closest uh, uh, construct, which would be binge eating disorder, focuses on the roots of the problem and underlying issues and managing relationships with food. And uh, even the money, this is what uh, actually uh, most people from the eating disorder uh, community uh, uh, well uh, express, that the demonization of food may even promote guilt, stress, and even facilitate the overeating cycle would be becoming some sort of counterintuitive or, counter or, or paradoxical. Um, also, there is a lot of work to be done in terms of identifying the specificities, specificities of the construct. So the similarities and differences with binge eating disorder, and uh, this is a recent article that actually uh, suggests that food addiction can have a role uh, as a subtype of binge eating disorders. We have, we have uh, heard a lot uh, over the past two hours around that. So <clears throat> if we broaden the picture and in for, for future studies, we need also to consider the impact of three components here. So one is definitely food, but we also have individual vulnerability or individual predisposition, and importantly, the context. Uh, so this is pretty much the three key components of the uh, food reward uh, uh, association. So we know that from individual predisposition to, by itself, uh, genetic uh, uh, genetic influences are or can be very, very dramatic and important, and these are extreme examples, but um, a single mutation in the leptin receptor gene can basically lead to a phenotype, extreme phenotype of compulsive over overeating that can be corrected by uh, leptin administration. And we, we heard a lot uh, about that in, in, during the discussion from, uh, from Hisham, um, but also at a more um, um, uh, common level, so um, carriers of uh, polymorphisms related to uh, dopamine receptors, uh, such as uh, the TAC-A1 allele of the DRD2 gene, uh, are, you know, this, carrying this, uh, this allele can also confirm vulnerability to, uh, to the dynamics of brain responses to food and have an impact in habituation-like processes and uh, risk of weight gain over time. And regarding food, we need to know exactly what type of food is the food that has more addictive uh, capacity or, ab or ability. It is sugar only, is it fat, is it a combination of both? Is it palatable food, processed food? 
we, we need to talk about doses, thresholds, and patterns. But I think it is also very important to talk about the context, which is one of the key forgotten components here. So I think attitudes to food are very, very important. I hardly mention in, uh, at least experimentally, it's very hard to, uh, to manipulate those things, but I think we need to be creative in the future and come up with experiments that also test the impact of uh, the context. Uh, attitudes to food, so dieting, pre preoccupation for food, perception of food, and rules around it. Um, it is true that over the years, our relationships with food have been becoming more and more and more complicated. So uh, it's not only about being healthy, it's about being sustainable, it's, a bit, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about being organic, it's about being uh, uh, mm, mm, according to, to the community. Or, there are so many, uh, so many rules that are piling up and it's very hard to, to, to keep up with all the rules. That, that basically provides a lot of load in, and, and burden and, and difficulties in for us to choose what to eat uh, and creates uh, anxieties, especially in people who are already preoccupied by food. And uh, there's also a very important role of stress and emotional influences and, uh, and also social cultural environment and values and the role of body image, because let's not forget that, that uh, a lot of the, uh, or many uh, motivators for losing weight is, are related to the concept of body image, not only related to health, but not only related to health, and the, the benefits of losing weight, but also uh, the, the social value of having a, a, a suitable body or, or uh, socially accepted or a, a good body image according to social standards. And also as societies where availability of alternative re rewards, we, we need to address whether this is the same in individualistic societies versus collective societies, societies who, ha who have access to other sorts of or have more access uh, by default on additional sources of reward, like, like social reward by default versus individualistic societies. So there's a lot of, 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 there's a lot of things that we, we need to be uh, addressing and researching uh, regarding the context. So the majority of or the studies that we have seen uh, regarding your imaging, uh, basically what, uh, what, they, what, they, uh, what they show is basically it looks like a microscopic uh, view of the problem, so we have reward-related region regions, some, some cases like restricted to sp specific re regions, and then the role of appetizing food that typically is uh, injected or, mm, or tasted during scanners, but also the reality is that there is much more than that. We have uh, cognitive control influences, homeostasis, and then the, the environmental uh, contributors, which are uh, at the family level, at the Microenvironmental level, like neighbor, neighborhood, or or um, uh, communities, uh, colleges, school, and then microenvironmental level. So we also have uh, the role of uh, policies, etc. So all that ultimately impacts and modulates the association between uh, reward-related brain regions and, and food. So I'm going to be talking about in the second part of my talk about cognitive control of food intake, and is the the third factor. Uh, so we hear a lot about reward, obviously, that is in the center, and homeostasis, the role of energy balance and appetite regulation at the basic level. But beyond that, we also have cognition and uh, humans. Actually, we are particularly endowed with, uh, uh, with, the, with parts of the brain that are uniquely human and um, actually support these high-level mental processes. Uh, a great example of that is a hunger strike. So we humans or some humans uh, are able to, uh, to, extreme, to, to, to basically fast till death for political reasons. And this is a very nice example coming out from a diary of Bobby Sands, who was a political activist and poet who died out of a hunger strike in 1981. And as he was going through the hunger strike, he was writing uh, how he was feeling about it. And he, he was recording the desire for food that he developed and then the internal fights that he had, but then at the end, the body fights back, and uh, he says, and the consideration, the primary consideration of all is the mind. The mind is the most powerful thing. So uh, this gives you an idea that we humans are capable or of, because of a cognitive uh, reason or abstract symbolic reason to fast till death. And that's something that we, you know, it's very powerful, and we also have to, uh, to study more in detail. But at a more daily basis, we, we are typically confronting on a daily basis, we have the, the dilemma of 
an environment that is, is full of appetizing food, and then uh, we need to fulfill our internal goals, which are, in most cases, stay healthy and, and control weight. So we also have an intersection or a balance or a conflict between uh, these, uh, these two components, and actually these components map to different, partly differentiated bin regions, but also very integrated. And we can see here where pretty much these areas map to. Uh, and executive functions, which are these areas that I mentioned here uh, in, in green, basically, uh, are important to support goal-oriented behavior. So our ability to eat based on goals, so to, to implement rules or norms or, or what, we, what we know from dietary advice into the way we eat. So to be able to do that, we need uh, a good and healthy uh, working or functioning of these regions. And Executive functions can be divided into three key components uh, according to uh, cognitive psychology mod models. And uh, inhibitor control, that's one, cognitive flexibility and working memory. And it is, it is thought or it is believed that uh, more complex cognitive uh, mechanisms or processes uh, such as decision making arise from a combination of the, these three key components. Uh, so I'm going to give you some examples of the power of cognition to uh, uh, to modulate uh, food reward uh, uh, responses in the brain. So this is a, these are neuroimaging studies using either PET or fMRI here, uh, where uh, subjects are asked to voluntarily control hunger. And you can see that when, in this case, men uh, are asked to voluntarily control hunger, to suppress uh, their thoughts on hunger. Um, so you see the activation. This is in blue means a decrease in activity. Uh, in areas that are involved in reward, as you can see in the straight areas and some middle or frontal regions. Um, in these other studies, subjects are exposed to food and they are asked to think about the food in two different ways. In the later condition, they, they have to imagine the consequences of eating that food, and in the now condition, they have to uh, imagine the immediate consequences of eating the food that is presented to them. So it's the same food, but what is being manipulated is the thought about the food. And you can see that this absolutely triggers the two different networks. When subjects are thinking about the future consequences of eating the food, these cognitive control executive functions related regions light up. And when subjects uh, focus on, the, uh, on thinking about the immediate consequences of food, this reward or limbic, uh, re, re, you know, these regions that we saw um, the, uh, before uh, uh, in, in, in different studies, but these this regions related to reward uh, tend to light up. So we see this dissociation between cognition and reward in, in experimental manipulations. We also see recruitment of these uh, cognitive control regions when, when, when we do uh, or when people have done studies with fMRI related to uh, healthy eating and when they, un when they are asked to do decisions that involve uh, rejecting appetizing yet unhealthy food. So you can see uh, activation in this, in the lateral prefrontal cortex, and the activation is also linked to uh, changes in the reward value that is a reward-related region in the medial orbital frontal. Uh, but also, uh, cognition is important, and executive functions are important, and there is a very uh, important link with obesity and overeating that is found at multiple levels. So uh, there is a link before. Uh, so self-control early in life is associated with other BMI. They are very, this is just one study, but there are other studies that show that, especially with tasks related to delay, gratification, and uh, the marshmallow task, and things like that. Uh, so those performance in those tasks tend to predict uh, other BMI uh, in the long run. Uh, during obesity, there is also an association, and BMI is inversely associated with prefrontal brain perfusion and performance in executive function tests. So there is a lot of uh, here studies. These are just two examples, and uh, this is a uh, systematic review that actually uh, shows an association with spe specific aspects of cognition, especially in the, in the area of uh, executive functions uh, in association with eating behavior and BMI. But also after, so weight loss following bariatric surgery tends to be associated with a small improvement in executive functions. So we see association before, during, and after. Uh, there is also a link between uh, some as aspects of cognition represented by personality factors, which is another way of looking at it. So consen conscientiousness, which is, a, which is a personality factor that maps well to this uh, dorsal 
those larger prefrontal regions involving executive functions. Uh, so it's associated with weight instability uh, during pretty much uh, a long, long periods of time. These are studies that were done in, in thousands of individuals that were followed up to, I think, 40 or 50 years. So there's a strong association between scoring high in conscientiousness that we know maps to these cognitive-related regions and weight stability and also weight loss maintenance. So the uh, National Weight Control Registry that one of the founders of, uh, of it is here on my side, Jim Hill. So studying these guys who are kind of like the lead club of obese who are really, really good in keeping the weight off for a long period of time. If we look at their brains, they, they show signs of higher activity in these cognitive related regions. So in the lateral prefrontal cortex, there have been some very interesting fMRI studies that actually line up with this evidence in terms of, uh, in, with the links with personality. There is also some link with causality. There is some brain lesion studies. Uh, uh, leading, there are certain lesions in the brain that can lead to overeating. We know that from the clinic. There is also some links of causality using uh, animal work. This is a study done in France with mini pigs. And this is experimental obesity, so these mini pigs are fed. Uh, until they become obese, and then they look at their brains, and as a consequence of weight gain, there is a decrease in perfusion in prefrontal regions that are involved in, uh, in cognition, as well in other related reward-related uh, related, uh, reward re related regions. But uh, as you can see, a lot uh, of it is, uh, is, is represented by this decrease in perfusion in the dorsolateral and anterior cingulate cortex, which are cognition-related regions. So, okay, so we have also a very strong link with uh, cognitive control, and uh, so how we can take advantage of it and integrate it in the uh, whole approach to food. So there is some very interesting emerging studies that are trying to use nutrition, and I thought this could be interesting for this audience, that is the American Society of Nutrition, but it, there is evidence that certain foods could potentially facilitate cognitive control or at least influence related brain regions and potentially could modulate the food reward uh, associations. We, we don't know, this is probably speculative, but I think this points to that direction and so we need more studies or kind of changes in food compositions, whether we can make you know, different com components or something so that the reactions can be modulated. So we need, uh, so studies with, with, with neuroimaging have, have shown that for instance, uh, cocoa, which is something that actually is associated very much with sugar, uh, so th that is rich in flavanol, can enhance prefrontal parietal uh, brain activity during tasks. These are randomized controlled trials. So really serious, uh, uh, I mean, well-designed studies. And, and this, these studies show that, um, for instance, a high flavanol-rich cocoa intervention can enhance the activity in these brain regions. Also, daily intake of omega-3 DHA at level of 400 to 1,200 milligrams for eight weeks in healthy children. Also, it's associated with an increase in prefrontal recruitment during working memory tasks. Uh, or also, we have another study where a high nitri nitrate di uh, diet, which involves uh, or it is made of leafy green vegetables and beetroot, beetroot uh, juice, among other things, can increase brain perfusion in these cognitive control related regions, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate of older adults. Um, some other examples, but you know, the, the literature is just growing, but you know, some of these studies use these portable neurotechnologies that I told you about at the beginning. This is using FNIRS, so we can measure or quantify uh, changes in the concentration of hemoglobin in, in its oxygenated and deoxygenated and get, come up with a bold or, or an fMRI-like response, but in a portable, convenient manner. So I think the integration of these new neurotechnologies in, in the field can help accelerate our knowledge and, and to, to kind of like refine what we are knowing about this and to broaden, in the, the, to broaden all this up and integrate the role of uh, cognitive control uh, regions. So these are two studies. This is with uh, testing essence of chicken for seven days, and you see brain act increases in brain activation in a working memory task, and here with fish oil. There are other strategies that could facilitate cognitive control and potentially also modulate reward-related brain reactions uh, or responses to food reward. Physical activity is the, one of the uh, forgotten factors. Here I put it in capitals. So, <laughs> and I think it's very important how we as a society provide opportunities to walk and public transportation and all that, because life's, we not only eat, eat during the day, we also you know, engage in a lifestyle that if we also uh, you know, like provide opportunities or, or improve the quality of our lifestyle by default, that will 
translate potentially in more facilitation of this uh, component. But other approaches could involve mindfulness, medications, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive training, neuromodulation. I have special interest in, at least at, at the experimental level, in testing non invasive brain stimulation to enhance cognitive control and potentially uh, help lose weight, also neurofeedback. So, to conclude, uh, the food addiction model. Uh, offers a perspective uh, to study the influences of food reward on eating behavior. However, at present, there is only limited evidence for its application and validity in humans beyond extreme phenotypes related to binge eating disorder that we have seen uh, before. So to extrapolate the food addiction model to, uh, to the whole obesity, I think that we, there is a lot of research that needs to be done, but we are not there yet. So cognitive control plays an important role in the regulation of food intake in humans, and it's a key mediator of brain responses to food reward and is relevant to resist and overcome food cravings, overeating and obesity. And interventions targeting cognitive control and related brain regions represent also a promising alternative strategy to promote healthy eating and healthy weight. And that's, that's it. Thank you.